It's been called a lot of things. Fat boy, death star, get shorty. Ethical, however, is not one of them. But behind these amusing names is a sinister ploy run by those in charge of the electricity that we all use. Costing consumers billions of dollars and allowing big companies' revenue to skyrocket to unimaginable levels. It's gaming the market, how mankind's most precious commodity can be played like a game. In this episode of 61 Minutes, we'll be exploring the electricity market, the key players in the wholesale of our precious electricity, and how the way it's traded affects you. Electricity is everywhere. It's in your phones, in your laptops, and in your toaster, and everywhere in our homes. It powers everything that we do, from the lights that we use to the trains that we board to get around. And if you're lucky, you might even have a fancy new electric car. And while it definitely might seem like it, this electricity doesn't just come out from nowhere. Everywhere around us, you might notice transmission lines and distribution grids, taking power from massive generators and through a complex system, sending that power straight to you. This power can come from any one of hundreds of different power sources, from coal-powered plants, hydroelectric generators, or massive wind and solar farms. In New South Wales alone, there are over 87 large-scale electricity generators. Add it all up, and they have a maximum capacity of 18.3 gigawatts. That's plenty more in, than enough power to run the 3 million properties in New South Wales. Or perhaps an array of smaller generators, like the panels that many people have up on their rooftops. All of these sources of electricity need a way to be able to sell their power. And that is where the electricity market comes into play. We'll be speaking to specialists, engineers and analysts later on. But first, just to get an idea of the bigger picture, I'll be meeting up with representatives from the Australian Energy Market Commission, just to get an idea of how the market works. Hi, I'm Alistair Sproul. Hi, I'm Glenn from AMO. From AMO? That's an interesting last name. Oh no, my name's just Glenn. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, how does the electricity market work? I mean, um, who decides what we pay? The Australian electricity system runs on a deregulated system. It is operated by two entities, known as the ISO and the RTO, which are non-commercial organisations. <coughs> Australia's ISO is AMO, and its RTO is Transgrid. AMO forecasts and schedules generation to make sure supply meets demand, with enough backup for unexpected rises in demand. By submitting a bid to the spot market, generators and load serving entities can receive and offer electricity to the power grid on a 30 minute basis. By considering the cost of marginal losses, transmission congestion cost and system energy prices, a marginal price is then set based on location. Okay, so if this is how the energy market runs, what makes the price rise on a year by year basis? There are many reasons we see increased prices in electricity. Naturally, a few sources such as coal or gas intrinsically affect the pricing. In addition, higher demand absolutely affects our electricity pricing. That's why our retailers provide time of use tariffs. It also protects us customers from seeing those spot prices. Um, so, as I understand it, grid gaming has become quite a bit of a hot topic lately. Um, but what exactly is it? Electricity gaming is used to gain profits by manipulating the rules set by AMO. Price spikes lead to higher wholesale prices, which reach the end of use tariff. That's where the customer suffers. So what conditions do you think makes gaming possible? There are a number of rules in place to protect the market from gaming. However, crafty traders often find routes to manoeuvre them. That is why the Australian Energy Market Commission exists. They are constantly looking for ways to improve the wholesale electricity market. Now, this isn't all just hypothetical. In fact, 
in the early 2000s. Enron, a used-to-be major energy player in California, took electricity gaming to the extreme. I caught up with Amancio Fulton and Benedict Cambabam to better understand exactly what happened 20 years ago. So we all know about the Enron scandal. A big part of it was their hand in California's energy market. Now, as an engineer in this industry, what can you tell us about that case? Enron, as a major market player of California, has been profiting millions and by manipulating the market through the state's operator. This is called grid gaming. Okay, um, are the legal rules set by the Californian government or by the ISO? Yes, the California ISO. Rules such as congestion payments and easily manipulated price caps were there, which made it possible for crafty traders to maneuver the system. So, uh, there were a number of memos found relating to the nicknames of strategies used. Um, they said things like Death Star and Ricochet. Uh, what do these exactly mean? Well, Death Star was the term used by Enron traders when they forced the Californian network to pay them extra for congestion relief. But isn't relieving congestion important? Um, what's, what's wrong with that? Not if you scheduled the congestion to happen in the first place. Often Enron traders are clever. They make sure to congest and schedule dispatch on t at lines that are already quite congested. And as a result, the California independent system operator are forced to pay Enron congestion relief payments. This could be up to around $750 per megawatt hour. Yes, and back then, the price cap for electricity was only $250 per megawatt hour. But that didn't apply to electricity from surrounding states. That's why megawatt laundering was possible. Well, that's what N1 people called ricochet. Basically, what they'd do is they'd generate the electricity themselves, but then because they could make more profit by selling it back as if it was out of state, they would sell it out of state, buy it for a higher price than the 250 cap, and then sell it into California at that exact price to make a profit. So was the cost of wholesale e electricity the only impact of Enron's grid gaming? From an economist's perspective, sure. You can think about costs, profit, profit margins. However, don't forget that electricity is one of the most precious commodities that mankind can produce. Think about energy justice. Think about honesty and trust. From all these events happening by Enron and the Enron scandal, Imagine the trust that's lost from the community in us as engineers. On top of Camberbound's points, Enron could simply sell their electricity out of state when prices there were more profitable. As a result, a state two emergency was once declared, which forced California consumers to restrict their users until the emergency was called off. If it was an extreme hot day, who knows what could have happened if air conditioning had to be curtailed? Um. Both of you have identified very important ethical issues from the Enron scandal. Now, as engineers, what is your perspective? You need to make sure profits are secured for the company, but you also have a duty to the people's trust. You are right. I have an obligation to my employers. However, as an engineer, I accept that my goal is to make sure everyone simply has electricity. And I choose not to let the pricing affect this goal. I work for a utility company. I make sure we provide that utility. What about our reputation as engineers? I believe that we'd be just as responsible if this was happened in Australia. Think about all our work. It'll be based on dishonesty and fraud. Now, Benedict Kamabam has offered to come and speak to us for a second time at the studio. After our chat with him and Amancio Fulton, he had a lot more to say. So we are delighted to have him here. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Benedict, for taking the time to come back here. I understand you, after we talked, you had a lot more that you wanted to say that you couldn't really get across last time. Uh, I think it's very important to understand that grid gaming involves maneuvers specific to regulations set by different system operators. Uh, as we discussed before, California's N1 scandal is the easiest example. Yeah. Um, Amancio and I briefly explained the concept of uh, Death Star Ricochet. 
Um, but let's not forget the other tactics that occurred. A common type would be where they'd make, they'd, where they take advantage of okay. the system operator setting a cap. So yeah. during the 2000s, there was an energy crisis, and to protect customers, they often set a cap around $250 per megawatt hour. Back then, that's pretty much nothing, right? Mm -hmm. So how can you expect these companies to be making more profits? Yeah. However, clearly this was designed for good faith, for honesty, for trust. Okay. And as an engineer, I'd say integrity as well, integrity of the people who were doing this. Yes. Um, so you can see how this price cap was really important. Um, moving forward, okay. let me just uh, scroll down through my notes one moment. No worries. So yeah, so this cap of $250 per megawatt hour, it was applied to generators only in California. Only in California. And as America has 51 states, yes. there's a lot around there. So anyone could use Ricochet as a form of grid gaming, mm. as we explained I think you before. mentioned that last time. Y yes, 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 I had. Yes, I did. Well, let's not forget that during the energy crisis, prices reached the cap all the time. People, okay. you know, there was demand. It was required. Um, in other states, though, the cap was way beyond that. So, so obviously... It was higher or lower? It was higher. Higher than 250 okay. per megawatt hour. And, you know, although it's not illegal, you could imagine that the... Um, there was a lot more incentive to sell it at other states. Okay, yeah. Um, and then, then again, don't forget, anyone is a trader as well. So they could trade electricity, but they could, and they're also generators. Often, what they decided to do is, instead of just generating and then selling out of state, yeah. you know, to just to make more profit, right? Mm -hmm. No one's going to stop them from selling their commodities elsewhere. Yeah. But instead, they buy electricity within state, below the 250 cap max because obviously that's what California's um, system operator set it as and then what they'd do was they'd sell that to a different state at a higher price higher than $250 making because a profit the other states don't have that $250 cap yes exactly okay exactly. you're following pretty well nice work okay and then there's also get shorty okay. so get shorty was obviously their term that they used but you know what short selling stocks is right yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the idea is you sell for higher and you buy it back for lower. Yeah. yeah. And what Enron would do is that they involved or they incorporated their ancillary mm. services. So that's the promise or the guarantee that a generator will supply a base load in if the, the grid required it. Yeah, are you following? I think so. Okay, awesome, awesome. So. so what they do is they'd sell that within the state to other generators mm. for a higher price because obviously you know, every, every generator wants to bid into the market. Yeah. But then they'd buy that back at a lower price when the demand wasn't as high. Okay. So just like shares, you sell it for a lot higher, you yeah. buy it back for a lot less, you got money. Um, yeah, and I can keep them going on um, about all these cases. Okay. Um, now, you've given us a lot of information about what exactly they did, but yeah. was this all legal? It seems to me that it was. Yes, actually, most of the time, you wouldn't be breaking the law. It only happened, I think the only time they would break a law is when they would falsify information. So for ancillary services mm -hmm. and get shorty to work, you'd actually have to lie about where your ancillary service was coming from, about in terms of which generator mm -hmm. it was coming from. Okay. Other than that, you're not really breaking any laws. However, it's more like breaking ethics yes. Yes. and when I say breaking ethics I mean when you're basically lying to lying and breaking the trust of our communities but then again I think nowadays in Australia yeah. most of us know about these uh, tactics it's different um, you'd have to be a lot smarter to get around it's just because you know we learn from these um, that's true actions that's true in Australia, the cases are a lot fresher, though. That's the they, issue. They are. Um, this, this sort of stuff, we're only covering this now, yeah. recently, whereas it's happened in America 20 years ago. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, in around, around 2017, you know, let's look at Queensland. 2017 was a year about the most good gaming that occurred. Okay. Yeah. So let's look at Queensland. We have Stanwell and CS Energy, okay. who generate around 70% of the, of the state's electricity. They're also government-owned as well. Okay. 
Um, and we found that in, you know, in the stats show that in 2017, they made back around 60% return on investment. And that's quite good, you know, applause to them. But then you also realize that suddenly tariffs went up by around, tariff prices, I should say, okay. went up to around 20% increase. When you say tariff prices, tariff on what? So I was, so as in how much the consumers are paying. Okay. okay. You know, and within just the summer of 2017, that's quite a lot. You can't yeah. just blame yeah. um, coal prices for that. Yeah. Um, and once again, you can imagine you know, breaking ethics are occurring. Yeah. Um, yeah, so obviously Queensland is under the NEM and you'd expect them to act in good faith. However, sources show that although we have a very high cap of $14,000 per megawatt hour, mm -hmm. much higher than California's at around, you know, in the year 2000, um, the idea that it's so much higher gives these companies the incentive to increase their prices to that cap. So meaning you're staying within regulation, you're staying within the law. But you want to keep it as high for as long as possible. Yeah, exactly. So we actually have data showing that in the summer of 2017, mm -hmm. you know, midday, where although, yes, you can have aircon running, so demand could be higher, but in Queensland alone, compared to all the other states, we see that the cap price is being reached around three times within a f span of like two hours. Wow. So that is quite irregular. Um, it shows that, you know, whoever is bidding into the market is definitely trying to inflate their prices. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, these are all allegations. Nothing can be proven because, you know, their spokespersons always say, you know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of bull. Yeah. yeah. They would, but um, it's government run, shouldn't it be safe? That's the thing. The government itself had to rein in their own government companies, their own government generators, and then you s we started to see that the cap wasn't being reached anymore, but the NEM still functioned. Okay. So that shows, or at least that leads us to think that prices were artificially being inflated. Okay, so um, what you've been talking about now, that's more sort of just based around allegations that have been made. Um, but bef before we sort of go into that, what, what's possible for the government to do? What sort of action can they hmm. take? I did have a little bit more to talk about, but um, okay, okay, let, let me scroll down a bit, let me scroll down a bit. Um, yeah, so for my notes here, I had a few points. So uh, Australia should learn a bit from the Enron scandal. Mm -hmm. We saw that having that such a low cap and you know, having the availability of other states to sell to gave Enron the chance to you know, buy cheaper and then sell out of state at such higher prices, mm -hmm. pretty much, you know, you know, stripping the commu California community of the electricity they need. Yeah, I think I mentioned last time that you know they went into a state of crisis for that case. Um, but at least since I think the NEM has done a pretty good job in yeah. making sure that most of Australia's states are involved in the same you know set of umbrella re of reg you know regulations from AMO. Okay. But then going on to AMO, I think we should give AMO more power more power to rein in companies when they're suspected of grid gaming. This could mean that they can tell AGL, for example, mm -hmm. they could, maybe they might see that AGL's, you know, prices are peaking to the $14,000 $14, cap way too often in a day. They could say, you know what? No, you guys are shutting down and that's it. If we gave Omo that kind of power, that means that the repercussions are so much higher and it's sort of like a fear factor. You know, you don't, these companies don't want to lose money. It costs money to stop a generator, to slow down. You know, it also takes time. Yeah. Um, also, I think we should look at New South Wales. New South Wales has a lot more competition. Mm -hmm. um, and looking at the data, it shows that grid gaming barely occurs because you have so, much, so many different companies trying to bid into the market that if one does try to pull out there's obviously going to be another that another you know one. bids in, yeah. and that can that would probably stop them from good gaming. You know, you, you'd stop, you'd definitely stop them from trying to constantly you know um, pull out bids and rebid. And then, I think that's why renewable energy is quite important. You know, it might take like 20 years to build a new generator, so then you know 20 years to 
for another competitor to come into the market. Mm -hmm. However, you can finish a solar farm or a wind farm within a year, or maybe within two years. Mm -hmm. And you know, that means competition can rise a lot higher. And as we all know, competition in the market is good for the consumer. Yeah, it drives, yeah. Yeah, it yeah. drives down prices, right? The Enron scandal has been fleshed out, written about, and verdicts have been passed. Enron Corporations itself went bankrupt on December 3rd, 2001. Now, 18 years later, suspicions arise over the high prices of electricity that we are finding on home soil. I'm here with Alex Andrelsfoot, a retailer analyst, and Dr Ian Skinner, spokesperson of the Australian Energy Market Commission. Now, we found that in July of 2016, over 200 high price settlements took place in South Australia alone. How can your expertise explain this? Well, you know the increased prices of energy? It's inevitable. Fuel sources always get expensive. However, these spikes in wholesale prices are usually a result of spikes in demand and supply not being quick enough. Ian? Well, South Australia has very few dominant market powers in the electricity sector. When they go into an energy crisis, the quickest to profit are those powers. The Australian Energy Market Commission operates these markets and makes rules to limit those occurrences. But these rules are never enough. There are a number of behaviours that bring about such high prices and such high price settlements. Could you elaborate on these behaviours? Well, the easiest is to withhold electricity until prices are just high enough to make more profit, but not breaking our rules. If we had graphs of electricity, we would find that these companies are increasing their prices until, until it gets really close to the cap at around $14,000 per megawatt hour, and then it drops back down. This is, of course, the simplest method to make money. Now, what about Western Australia? Synergy was recently accused by the Economic Regulations Authority for gaining profits of $192 million over the market's limit. Could you comment on that? Well, yeah, the ERA conducted about 15 months of investigation on Synergy. They dominate Western Australia's market and it's very easy for them to make a profit with the, reg with the regulated margins. However, any decent analyst can look at these numbers and tell you that they made a lot more than regulated. And well, that's the issue, isn't it? In this industry, we set rules. We expect all stakeholders to communicate, to be honest, to do what's best for the community. Breaking those rules can attract fines of up to a million dollars, but compared to the profits they make, it doesn't mean much more than a slap on the wrist. That's an interesting point you've brought up, but there's always more than just a financial penalty. As you would likely be aware of, dishonest practices when they come to light in the public can become a source of huge penalty in the form of public image and trust. Now, earlier on, we went ahead and talked to a regular Joe, a bloke who goes by the name Eduardo Chiem, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, on the street, to see what they thought about it all. We explained what was happening with Grid Gaming and then asked their opinion. Hey there. Um, oh, hello. Hello. Uh, so, uh, do you have a moment? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, that's cool. So. Um, I'm from the News Corporation. Okay, so um, did you know that your energy providers, okay, what they can do is they can hike up prices of electricity. What they do, so the AMO, they're the ones who regulate pr the, the electricity market, right? But what these electricity providers, they do is they go and they find loopholes in the system and they work around those so that they can increase their profit and that ends up increasing prices for you. Um, how do you think this might affect you in other ways? I have seen that there had been gradual increase in the electricity price, mm -hmm. um, especially sudden increase over the summer. Oh, okay. And I know AMO is the one responsible for the price of the electricity. Um, what are they doing right now? Mm -hmm. Good question indeed. What are they doing? We are trying to place countermeasures against the grid gaming. Currently, dispatch periods are at around 5 minutes and trading periods at around 30 minutes. Dispatch data represents the demand and trading data represents the price of electricity. Clearly, 
30 minutes to 5 minutes is different. However, we're trying to implement a new system so that the trading and swap period can be updated every 5 minutes by 2021. That means we can see huge changes in wholesale market real quickly. By doing this, we can promote sustainability by making sure that all our stakeholders, including our customers, pay their fair share of electricity. Thank you, Dr. Skinner, for reassuring our viewers that the AEMC and Australian government are working to consistently protect us from questionable market power behaviour. It is definitely concerning what some people can do to get around regulations that are built to protect everyone involved in the buying and selling of electricity. But it's comforting knowing that market operators have learnt from the Enron scandals and similar happenings here in Australia. And it seems that, at least for now, things are under control. <laughs>